Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Luke Lowacki. He is Assistant Professor in the Department of Anthropology at Boston University and a faculty affiliate of the Center for Innovation in Social Science. He studies the evolution of complex social behavior, including cooperation and war, and he has done extensive fieldwork among nomadic pastoralists along the Ethiopian slash South Sudanese border studying inter-ethnic violence. And today we're going to focus on topics surrounding anthropology of war slash conflict, the debate between the deep rooters and the shallow rooters, and we're going to get into what those uh, terms mean exactly, human cooperation, peace systems, and some other related topics. So, the, uh, Dr. Glowacki, welcome to the show. It's a big pleasure to everyone. Thanks for having me here. I'm really honored and, and thrilled to be here. I'm a big fan of your podcast, so thanks for making the time to speak with me. No, it's a big pleasure, and uh, I mean, one of the main reasons why I invited you on is because, as you probably know, as you're aware, I've already had on the show people from both sides of the debate, of the ongoing debate in the anthropology of war, the deep rooters on the one side and the shallow rooters on the other, and at this point, and since you wrote a very interesting article recently precisely about this debate, I thought that it would be very interesting to have you on the show to talk about that and to get, uh, let's say, a middle ground <laughs> position uh -huh. here. So let's get into some of the issues that surround this debate. So first of all, first of all what is war? I mean, from the perspective of anthropology and the work that's done by anthropologists, how would you define war? And I'm asking you this because sometimes it seems to me that some of the debate gets lost around what people classify as being war or not, and sometimes they look at for example, archaeological remains, and they sometimes people interpret, it, interpret some of it as being the result of warfare, and then other people come to the table with uh, an, op an opposite interpretation of the what might have led to people's deaths there, right? So, uh, so let's start with the definition there. Yeah, this is this is the question to start with, because the answer to this question really shapes a lot of the debate and people mean different things when they use the term war. Many people think about, oh, it's not war unless there's organization, you have some type of commanders, you have complex technology. So, of course, chimpanzees don't have war. Of course, hunter gatherers don't have war. And if that's your definition of war, it, it makes a lot of sense. But Anthropologists that take a comparative or evolutionary perspective, such as myself, we try to see what different populations have in common or different species have in common. We try to find a definition that's more generalizable, that's not dependent on any like one particular type of social organization, such as like having commanders or leaders or one species. So the definition that most of them or what most definitions have in common is it's war includes coalitions attempting to kill or injure other coalitions. So, but some people will say, oh, we exclude raiding, we exclude feuding, revenge raiding. Um, so the definition that I use and a lot of other evolutionary scholars is just intergroup coalitionary killing. Mm -hmm. So it's when coalitions from one group kill an individual from another group. And the group is, obviously it's always very difficult to define groups, but usually we just determine as social groups. So it could be clans, it could be families, it could be communities, bands, tribes. So in that sense, it could include feuding between, say, different clans of a larger ethno-linguistic group or band. It can include revenge violence, you know, as long as it's between recognized or distinct social groups and it's coalitionary based. So if it's dyadic, you know. I've got a grudge against you or somebody else. And even if you're a member of a different group and I, I go to take revenge on you, not as part of a coalition, not sanctioned or supported by my community, that's homicide, which mm -hmm. is different. And, and your question really got it at 
what is part of like the crux of the problem is like when is it homicide and when is it war right so intergroup coalitionary killing and war is not unfortunately it's a really horrible term to use for what we're describing right because it has so much cultural baggage even when i think about it i think about you know organization complexity um when you know a cultural institution versus this just very rudimentary intergroup coalitionary killing so i often think of like you know marriage versus pair bonding mm -hmm. marriage is a cultural institution so only humans have it but it incorporates different type of pair bonding and other species besides human pair bond so when we use the term war we often think of this cultural institution but from an evolutionary perspective that's not what we mean we mean just this very simple behavior of intergroup coalitionary killing um so a lot of the debate between the deep rooters those who think that war has a long evolutionary history and was important in human evolution and the shallow rooters people that think war is really recent and not very important in human evolution comes i think comes from this definition do you do you use the term war to mean that it has complex structure chains of command or do you just mean like intergroup coalitionary killing which could include feuding revenge raiding things like that mm -hmm. so i use the latter um just intergroup coalitionary killing mm -hmm. yes because that's the thing um uh, probably that's one of the reasons those two different kinds of definitions why the shallow rooters many times argue that we only find war in societies that have a certain type of organization or structure, uh, namely uh, the ones that are based on agriculture or the industrial ones, because uh, I mean, for for example, forager societies, hunter gatherer societies, horticultural societies. Um, some of the ways they could mobilize people for war. I mean, they don't really have um, as um, the, the same kinds of means that people who, for example, uh, have chieftains or kingdoms and or some other uh, social organization like that would have. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Once you get increasing socio-political complexity in other words yeah. the ability to organize people and coerce their behavior then it makes it much more easy to mobilize people for war yeah. to have people take risks for war which is probably one of the reasons you know chiefdoms have much more war than say mm -hmm. tribal societies tribal societies have much more war than band level societies is because it makes it much easier to mobilize people and you know early agricultural states were exactly that you know they were they had you know complex social structures that mm -hmm. enabled people to organize and collectivize for war which is why you see agriculturalists typically have much higher rates of war than hunter gatherers and that's a point that i think both the deep rooters and the shallow rooters will agree on is that agriculturalists typically have higher rates of war, maybe not all of them, but most of them, than say mobile or nomadic hunter-gatherers who ha typically have the lowest rates of war compared to other forms of social complexity and social organization. Mm -hmm. Yes, and later on we'll get into some of the ecological factors that play a role in both warfare and peace. Uh, but uh, of course, one of the biggest points of the debate has to do with the sources we use to study the origins of warfare. Because, I mean, at least as far as I understand it, the debate is not really about war existing or not. I mean, that wouldn't make sense. Of course, war exists, but it's much more about how old or ancient it is and sometimes perhaps people frame it in terms of it being part of human nature or not and so the sources i think are very important here what would you say are some of the main sources people look at to argue for or against war being uh, ancient in humans yeah so I, I like the way you frame the question that the debate really is about when did war evolve or de develop 
mm-hmm. and wasn't important in shape in human evolution. That's what they mean. That's what I think people mean when they say human nature is yeah. did it shape our psychologies and biologies in ways that are important today? So answering that is really you have to know when did it evolve like when did it develop so you um obviously we can't study it directly just like we can't study the evolution of any behavior directly so we have to use other types of evidence and make inferences based on what we find and a really important piece of evidence is looking at how closely related species species that are closely related to humans behave so these would be bonobos and chimpanzees they're equally related to us so we're not more closely related to chimpanzees we're equally related to them, but as well as like gorillas and orangutans, other great apes. Um, and if we find evidence of similar behavior across these species, especially chimpanzees, bonobos, and humans, we can use that as evidence that maybe the last common ancestor, the origin of this species, had this behavior, such as war, intergroup cooperation. The real challenge with this is that bonobos and chimpanzees are very closely related. They're only separated by like 2 million years, have radically different behaviors from each other. They're almost like totally different species with intergroup relationships. Chimpanzees typically are very hostile to members of other groups unless they're like reproductively viable females. Bonobos very famously have lots of intergroup cooperation they have mating, they have food sharing, they'll spend several days near other communities. So they're radically different species. And humans, obviously, we have traits of both bonobos and chimpanzees. Yeah, we sometimes have war, but we also do a lot of cooperation with other groups. Um, The second way we will um, look at the origins of war is to look at closely, um, sorry, not closely related species, but species that have similar types of social organizations or Mm -hmm. socioecologies. So humans are a fission fusion species. This means that we'll come together, our social organization is flexible, we'll fuse together, there'll be a bunch of us together, and then when things change, we'll go into smaller parties and go do our own thing, where we may be alone or with one or two other individuals. So we're not troop living. Like many monkeys are in troops, they're always with a whole bunch of other individuals. Humans are really flexible. So you'll look at what other species with fission fusion groupings do and ask whether they have war. And it turns out like wolves also have a fission fusion grouping system and lethal or intergroup coalitionary violence is a major source of mortality in wolves. So you may think that, oh, there's something inherent in the social system which gives rise to war. Um, Then you can also look at the paleoanthropological evidence such as fossils or skeletons. So, you know, these are buried in the earth for millions of years. People dig them up, they excavate them, they clean them carefully. And then you look for evidence of traumatic lesions, like traumatic injuries. So you find spear points or arrowheads or broken bones, crania that are fractured where it looks like somebody clubbed them. And this is a really, this is like the clearest evidence you know it's a material record where you can see a skull with a hole in it or you can see an arrow points in it but unfortunately there are some like real problems with relying too much on this skeletal evidence one is that there's just not many skeletons prior to 15 or 10,000 years ago that are intact enough to be able to infer the cause of death whether it's like they find a mandible somewhere they find part of a crania, they find part of a femur. So you've got the skeleton, but you can't actually tell what the cause of death was. So for instance, we assume, you know, in our evolution, humans were dying from um, being killed by wild animals, you know, either predated on or in hunting accidents. But you couldn't really test that with the paleoanthropological evidence because there's just not enough skeletons that are intact enough. In the same way, you can't really test the presence of war because there's not enough mm-hmm. skeletons that are intact enough. Um, up until like they, the evidence starts really accruing like in the past 10,000 years, but that's also the time we have agriculture. So it's difficult to disarticulate those two. Um, the other problem with using skeletons is there's been amazing studies done by George Milner and Patricia Lambert and others looking, for, looking at skeletons that we know where people died in war. So Milner, um, looked at skeletons where um, U.S. soldiers had died in the Indian wars on the, from the American colonizers on the frontier, so they knew that they had died in war, and found that something like um, only one out of three arrows actually damaged the bone of people. So these people went on to have serious injuries, but it wouldn't have showed up in their skeleton. 
So if you found their skeleton, you wouldn't have known that they died from arrow wounds. Patricia Lambert says only like one out of four stone points were clearly bedded in bone at her site. So if this is the case, if these are sort of accurate generalizations, you would expect something like potentially up to 75% of deaths to not be preserved in the record. Mm -hmm. um, so it makes it, what I take away from this is just that it makes it really hard to make many inferences on the basis of the skeletal record prior to 10,000 years ago. Um, and then finally, the third way that really gets us into a lot of controversy is you can look at the behavior and traits of more recent human populations, such as hunter-gatherers in the 19th or 20th century, horticulturalists, even you know contemporary societies. And then you try to extract or generalize back to say, what would have humans been doing in, um, in human evolution? But it's very controversial in part because it's not clear how good of a model recent hunter-gatherers are because their lives are in fact very different than say hunter-gatherers a uh, hundred thousand years ago so these are the primary kinds of evidence we use to think about the origins of war okay so let me ask you a few questions about each of those sources of evidence so starting with animal models so you mentioned two things there. I, I guess there are two different. They are two different things. One of them has to do with species that are phylogenetically close to us, like for example bonobos and chimpanzees, and the other is more uh, based on convergent evolution. I guess looking at species who are exposed to similar evolutionary pressures and so evolve societies that at least some of their sociality and social dynamics are close or closer to ours. So, but, but when it comes to the bonobos and the chimpanzees, um, I mean, I've heard, uh, uh, I mean, people coming from opposite perspectives when it comes to evaluating the evidence we have about them, because uh, there was a time where I heard, for example, that bonobos were so much less violent than chimpanzees and so since they are equally closely related to us uh, as chimpanzees are then people would argue that oh we can't just look at the chimpanzees bonobos are basically the opposite and so i mean you can't really make a very solid argument that if chimpanzees are so violent then we would expect humans to be similar to chimpanzees than bonobos i mean something along those lines but then uh, i also hear from people that in fact uh, bonobos might be a little bit more violent than some people have painted them and so uh, the evidence is not uh, so clear in terms of for example if someone wants to use bonobos as an animal model to study human violence uh, it wouldn't be as clear as some people put it that then humans would be uh, much more peaceful than people who use the chimpanzee as a model would argue. I, I mean, uh, what do you think about it? Yeah, so, I mean, this, what you're getting at is, is our understanding of bonobos is still really developing. So we've mm -hmm. been studying chimpanzees since the 60s, but long-term bonobo sites, studying bonobos in the wild is relatively recent. So as more time goes by, we get more data on bonobo behavior. And like when I was doing my PhD, everyone's like, oh, bonobos are entirely peaceful. They have very little aggression. You know, that's what many of us thought. But it turns out that that's not the case. But what's important to distinguish is aggression, dyadic aggression and coalitionary aggression and in-group okay. and out-group aggression. So bonobos have lots and lots of dyadic aggression. And I'm not a bonobo expert, but I'm very familiar with the secondary literature. They have lots of dyadic aggression, just like chimpanzees do. And humans are really unusual because we're different than both of them. We have very low dyadic aggression. We're not hitting, slapping, biting, threatening others very often. Um, bonobos also have intergroup aggression. So they'll, you know, come together with another party and they may bite or aggress against other individuals, but no evidence of coalitionary killings has emerged. 
So we don't have any evidence like chimpanzees, if they meet another group, they may either flee into the forest or some of them, if it's, you know, a larger group outnumbering, a, you know, a smaller group, you know, they may attack and kill them. There's no evidence right now of bonobos doing anything like that. Um, and I have an upcoming BBS paper on the evolution of peace. And one of the great strengths about this journal is people write commentaries. And one of the commentaries was by Martin Serbak and um, Samuni. Um, and they they looked at data from bonobo um, bonobo aggression within groups and between groups. And they said, yes, there is aggression between groups and bonobos, but that rate of aggression is not any higher than within group aggression. So it doesn't look like bonobos are extra aggressive mm -hmm. to outgroup members. So you can say, you know, and, the, and there's no evidence of them doing coalitionarily killing. So I think it's probably fair to say that for a model of how relationships between groups work bonobos are much more peaceful than mm -hmm. chimpanzees um and we're still learning a lot and in 10 years you know new evidence may emerge mm -hmm. that changes our our thoughts but right now that's what it looks like bonobos are they have much less they have virtually zero intergroup coalitionary killing mm -hmm. which we're defining as war and so if that's the case how should we look at or, or how how much uh, I mean when it comes to drawing conclusions or information from s the study of chimpanzee and bonobo behavior and applying it specifically to human warfare, is it possible to really claim that one animal model is better than the other, or that we should draw more information from? chimpanzees or bonobos yeah so you know very famously many respected scholars argue that chimpanzees are a very good model for deeper human evolution say seven million years ago but there's a whole literature arguing that bonobos are a better model we should think about bonobos being the ancestral species um for me so great brilliant scholars you know argue on both sides for me I think the evidence to conclusively say that, you know, either of these species is a good model on a, on a trait is not there yet. You know, this, the reconstructions are so deep. We don't have many fossil chimpanzees or fossil bonobos to look at their skeletons. I think it really depends on a lot of sort of tenuous evidence to have confidence in whether this species is a better model or that species. Um, you know, Christopher Bohm makes the argument that if we want to really be confident in a trait being found in a less common ancestor, it should be present mm -hmm. in bonobos, chimpanzees, and humans. And what we see about warfare is it's not present in bonobos as far as we know. It is present in chimpanzees, and it's variable in humans. It's present, but, you know, we, we often have positive intergroup relationships. So he takes the perspective that we can't confidently say at least war was present in the last common ancestor and that seems very reasonable you know bonobos and chimpanzees are radically different from each other but there's also those people that argue um that the last common ancestor was probably nothing like bonobos or chimpanzees you know it's seven million mm -hmm. years of evolution it's a lot of time um they may be radically different bonobos and chimpanzees today than what the last common ancestor was um you know, for me, I also take the perspective that, you know, in 7 million years, we have gone through a ton of evolution, you know, mm -hmm. so maybe it more matters what the Australopiths are like, or Homo erectus, than, you know, our evolutionary heritage of 7 million years ago. We know evolution can act very fast on traits, both biological traits and behavioral traits, right? So, you know, there's tons of evidence about gene culture evolution happening in a very short periods that, you know, maybe it's just not that important what's happening seven million years. I think probably what's a lot more important is what's been happening for the past two million or three million years, you know, since the origin of our genus and certainly since the origin of archaic humans some 300,000 years ago. Um, so generally, I think, you know, all of us that are working in the evolutionary sciences should, you know, have a little bit of sort of skepticism about confidence of, of things that occurred so long ago. Um, you know, and willingness to sort of entertain the other position. And that's certainly like what um, I think as I've looked 
look more closely at arguments thinking that maybe the uh, chimpanzee is not a great model for evolution. It's really, you know, to me, wow, there are reasons to think that maybe um, other species are a better model. Um, anyway, so I have a bit of skepticism about whether we can confidently use either species. And, and so since you mentioned uh, species from the Homo genus, I would like to ask you a little bit more now about archaeological sources because as far as I'm aware and, and of course it's fair enough because we're talking about Homo sapiens here and not about Homo erectus for example but uh, most of the sources people point to are I don't know tens of thousands of years old at best so uh, do people who work on the anthropology of war or peace systems look uh, into or tend to look into uh, spe other species of our genus like, I don't know, uh, Homo neanderthalensis, Homo erectus, the Denisovans and others yeah. like that. Yeah, I mean, we're, we'd certainly be interested if we found war, you know, present in closely related species to ours, you know, we would be like, that'd be further support for a sort of convergence, or mm -hmm. sorry, for, you know, and then for a phylogenetic inertia, you know, that we somehow inherit at war. Um, I think part of it is there's just so few intact skeletal remains. There's certainly many more from Europe um, than there are from Africa, um, but I'm not very familiar with the with the evidence, like with the actual skeletal evidence in Europe. Um, I don't know who would be, but you know, it's it's a little bit outside my wheelhouse. But I think the I think the real problem is is that um, you know, looking at African origins for our species, which you know mm -hmm. we evolved in Africa, is that there's just so little evidence like prior to Homo sapiens, so little skeletal evidence prior to Homo sapiens that you're really, you can't rely on looking at skeletons to make any type of confidence, any type of confident inferences about the presence of war in our past. And even the skeletons that you find, you know, where you can say, oh, this person, you know, probably died of a traumatic lesion. Say there, there's a few of them where it looks like you can't distinguish it from homicide. So homicide is dyadic, right? One individual kills another, it's not sanctioned by the group versus coalitionary. And you, you find like, oh, this person has a broken cranium. There's just one body. It could be homicide, it could be war. You can't <clears throat> distinguish them. And the reason you can't is because war, the thoughts of war early in our species was very sort of simple, for lack of a better word, unorganized. It was basically like, raiding parties or patrols of chimpanzees a few individuals go out they locate a you know an unknown individual a strange individual they ambush them and they kill them and they leave a single body so in the archaeological record it's going to look like homicide so it would and we don't have any means to distinguish between them so even where you do find some evidence of violent conflict you can't tell whether it's war or are homicide, which is why these other p sources of evidence, what other species do or what other populations of humans do become so important. Mm -hmm. But uh, looking then at the archaeology we have of Homo sapiens and potential warfare tens of thousands of years ago, I mean, I guess that this is very important to discuss here because, for example, not just for anthropologists, but even for, for the general public, for example, mm -hmm. in the Better Angels of Our Nature, Steven Pinker, of course, uses some, I don't know, 20 something sources from different sites around the globe uh, that supposedly point to human warfare and then uh, Brian Ferguson comes and disputes the evidence and he has different kinds of very compelling arguments disputing it. And then, of course, Robert Sapolsky uses Brian Ferguson's arguments in his book Behave. And so this is also something that is part of the larger, let's say, public uh, consci uh, consci mm -hmm. uh, consciousness. So. Uh, what do you 
think about it. I mean, uh, of course, it is. Not, uh, I'm not just limiting the question to the evidence that Steven Pinker used. Uh, there's more than there's. We can go beyond that evidence, that archaeological evidence. But what do you make of it? Do you think that? Uh, Steven Pinker and perhaps anthropologists who support his argument uh, have a point or in that regard when it comes to archaeology or archaeological evidence would you agree more with people like Brian Ferguson and their counter arguments? Yeah, so, um, you know, I'm glad you brought up better angels of our nature. Um, because this, in my opinion, as a scholar who studies war, this is such an important book. And it doesn't mean you have to agree with everything sure. in, in that book, but the idea to look at this like fundamental challenge of social science, like how did our societies experience this massive decline of violence? Like, did they? And I think that there's sort of overwhelming evidence, at least over the past couple of hundred years, and it's more debatable as you go further back, what are the causes of it? It's, um, to me, like a great example of bold, ambitious thinking. And, and the reason I give this plug for it is because people love to hate on it, um, you, like they love to hate on guns, uh, guns, germs, and steel. But it doesn't mean you have to agree <laughs> with everything in it. But hopefully it will like provoke you to do more scholarship. And in that sense, I think it has, because it's really gotten people to look very carefully at these remains. So they use, so what you're talking about is sets of archaeological remains where they found lots of bodies and or they found bodies and they've said you know this percentage of people have or these people died of violence and they've extracted out to the population and say these percentage of people from this population died of violence this percentage of people have died of violence this time and this data really... uh, by the way if i remember correctly i might be mistaken but i guess that the average percentage that pinker points to would be 15 percent of people would have died of uh, war related uh, stuff. I mean, it would be war related deaths. Yeah. So there's two types of evidence. And right now we're just talking about the archaeological evidence. He mm -hmm. also uses yeah, yeah. evidence from more recent hunter gatherer and small scale societies, which we can talk about. Um, and these data are really, yes. popular, really important because other people use them like uh, Bowles used them, I believe, the same set of sites in his models for parochial altruism. So they're really important. Um, so for me, it's been a while since I've looked at them, but I don't think they tell you a ton about, first off, when war evolved and how deep war was present, because they're not sites that are that recent. You know, they're not sites that are that deep. They're quite recent, right? You know, I think they're all within the past 15,000 years. So you're coming up on the... Um, advent of agriculture, societies at that point will have, you know, some socio-political complexity. So I don't think they're super relevant for thinking about when war evolved, but I think there is some evidence that, yeah, like, you know, um, I don't want to speak to each site and say, like, how important they are or not, because this is not my wheelhouse um, at all. But I would also be hesitant for any scholar to, like, you know, hang your entire argument on these sites, you know, because I think, um, you know, yeah. So anyway, this is a way of, I guess, saying like a quite long winded way. I don't know enough about the particular sites to speak with confidence about how reliable they are. Um, but I know we don't have what I consider like really strong evidence for warfare up until about 10,000 years ago, the site in northern Kenya, Lake Turkana, which looks like a massacre that happened with um, the people were hunter gatherers, but they were in a transitioning economy. So they had food storage, they had pottery and stuff like that. That to me is and that's right around nine to 10,000 years ago, the clearest evidence for warfare. Um, and that's right around the birth of agriculture. Mm -hmm. And that would already be in the Holocene. Yeah, it's right at the beginning of Holocene. Um, it's, you know, it's the clearest evidence of war. So I don't, but actually I think war goes much, much deeper than that. I think war is probably present at the birth of our species, but you just cannot rely too heavily on the archaeological rec record because there's just not that many sites where you find all these intact bodies. That's a little bit of a unique area because it's right at the shores of Lake Turkana where they were covered with mud mm -hmm. and all preserved. You know, typically you find just like scattered bones.
So would it be fair to say that at least when it comes to the archaeological evidence we have in, in this particular point, the shallow rooters would have better arguments? I mean, just when it comes to this particular point, of course. Yeah, so the shallow rooters will typically say, um, so I really appreciate their argument that, look, if war is happening, we should look for physical signatures of it. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly right. We should look and see if we see signs of fortifications, if we see bones, if we see weapons. Mm -hmm. um, so when we look, we don't really see those until recently, unfortunately. So they'll say that's evidence that war wasn't present. For me, I just think like, it's not the right place to look at the archaeological record because it's not strong enough. It's not good enough. Um, we just don't have enough preserved enough preserved remains. Um, let me just like pull up all right, my computer. Um, so in a, a paper I have coming out, I put in a table like all the um, all the paleoanthropological main, remains up until like fifteen thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're mostly like reading the Omo Kabish consists of a cranium, a fragmentary skull and a partial postcranial skeleton. So really not a lot of bones. So you see skull fragment, uh, Twin Rivers is just a humorous fragment. Um, the border cave, just a few postcranial fragments, um, Blind River, just a femur. These are all, you know, and there's something like um, I'm not sure how many sites, maybe like, you know, 30 to 60 sites. Mm -hmm. um, going all the way back to 200,000 years ago, and like very few of them are their complete skeletons, much less multiple skeletons where you'd be able to confidently infer the causes of death up until about, you know, 15,000 years ago. And then, you know, one of the earliest is, is the uh, Jebel Sahaba, which is very famous for, you know, where there's 58 skeletons and it looks yeah. like a lot of them are victims of death. And, and that site's really are victims of homicide or war. And that site's very controversial because of the dating and interpretation. But um, I would say that, you know, it's not that the shallow rooters have won the debate. They're right. There's no, there's very little physical um skeletal evidence of war but we shouldn't expect there to be just like there's not really physical evidence of people dying in childbirth of people being killed in hunting accidents of eaten by carnivores burned in fires you know surely struck by lightning dying of malaria sure you know ancestors 50 and 100,000 years ago were dying of these causes and we don't find evidence of it. Mm -hmm. um, we don't say, oh, people weren't dying in hunting accidents. We say we just wouldn't expect to find evidence for it. And when it comes to using contemporary traditional societies as sources of evidence for war, I mean, to what extent do you think we should rely on contemporary hunter-gatherer, horticultural societies, for example, as uh, sources of evidence for the evolution of war in humans? Yeah, such an important question, um, because this is, this is probably the most important piece of evidence that both deep rooters and shallow rooters use, is that we look at what hunter-gatherers are doing, and we say, aha, they have lots of war, aha, they don't have war. Um, but it really depends on how good of a model they are for ancestral populations. So you may argue, oh, they're really good models or really, really poor models for this reason or that reason. Um, but whatever your, uh, whatever your position, whether you're a deep rooter or shallow rooter, like, I think both sides should have a little bit of humility and say we don't actually know how good of models they are. And there may be reasons to think that they're not great models. And obviously, you know, recent hunter gatherers from the 1800s on have everywhere been impacted by colonization, impacted by globalization, impacted by the introduction of metal. They've experienced, you know, agriculturalist neighbors. They've experienced changes to their production and consumption systems, changes to their uh, social organization. So they're not perfect models. Yeah. Nonetheless, like a core aspect of evolutionary anthropology is looking at the behavior of recent humans, not just hunter gatherers, but like contemporary societies and trying to extract back. So for let's say, for instance, that you wanted to know whether like music or lullabies were important in human evolution. So I'm just picking a different example that's not as like loaded as war. 
you might begin by looking at modern industrial human societies and seeing, do people everywhere sing to their babies? You know, do they, do they use song to put their babies to sleep? And you say, wow, you know, people in Portugal, the United States, Brazil, Japan, we all do this. Well, let's look at hunter-gatherer societies and horticulturalists. So then you go look at them and you say, you know, wow, they also do. And it might be more important understanding what they're doing because they didn't like get this idea through YouTube or television, right? They all independently developed this idea of singing their babies to sleep. So, and we find it in every hunter-gatherer society. So then you might be like, wow, it's reasonable to think that humans have been doing this whenever we started fa facing the same challenges, those challenges of how do you get your baby to sleep? I have a one-year-old son. So this is like, I'm always thinking about how can I get him to sleep, right? Um, Humans presumably 50,000 and 100,000 years ago were doing the same, and they probably have done the same since they had that challenge and had the vocal apparatus that allowed them to sing. Um, and with that example, I think everybody would say, yeah, it's totally legitimate to look at hunter-gatherers, to think about what we may have done in our past. And war is not exactly analogous, but it's similar. If you just think of war as lethal, or as uh, intergroup coalitionary killings. You know, if you find hunter-gatherers all over doing it, you may think that oh, it's reasonable to think ancestral humans did it when they faced the same challenges and when they had similar forms of social organization. Um, so I think if you're careful, you can make some reasonable inferences, but you know, Obviously, like we all want to have humility and think that, you know, they're, they're inferences. We can't actually like rewind the clock and see what humans were doing, you know, 100,000, 200,000 years ago. Yeah, and I guess that the most important point here is really that when trying to extrapolate from contemporary traditional societies to prehistoric traditional societies, we have to be really careful about uh, being uh, as sure as possible if they have at least similar social structures and if they are exposed to similar ecologies, right? Yeah, you, that, would that be fair to say? I would say you want to try to make sure that whatever factors you think are important in producing war yeah. are present in those comparative mm -hmm. societies. So if right. you think that... Um, you know, our ancestral societies didn't have coercive social structures like leaders and forms of organization. It doesn't make sense to look at like states and see how they produce war for your comparison. You want to find societies that are decentralized where there's no coercive institutions. Um, if you think that these are important for the causes of war, other things could be different, right? You know, like, a, you know, maybe the weapons are different. We know like the bow and arrow isn't super um it's not, it's not very old, it's a relatively recent development in our species. So maybe it doesn't matter whether they have bows and arrows or they use spears. That may change some of the tactics, it may change some of the mortality rate, but it probably doesn't change like whether they have war or not. So you wanna make sure that those factors that you think are important for producing the behavior are as similar as possible between species, which is why people are really interested in decentralized societies, hunter-gatherers that, so that are not chiefdoms, so not like Pacific Northwest hunter-gatherers, um, but also like horticulturalists that have, you know, forms of social organization that are decentralized. Or a lot of my work has been with nomadic pastoralists. So they're um, people that produce livestock, you know, they produce and depend on livestock, so cows, goats, camels. But they also do tons and tons of hunting and gathering. Sometimes of the year, it's like 30% of the diet or more. Um, they also are highly mobile, like hunter-gatherers. They'll move around a lot. They have a very flexible social organization. So, you know, you may say in certain aspects, they're an okay model. Um, just like, you know, nomadic hunter-gatherers on the Kalahari may be better or worse models, depending on which parameters you're interested in. And so let's get into one of the myths that you tackle in your paper, the paper I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation. So uh, ancestral populations did not have anything to fight over or were too egalitarian to wage war. I mean, what's wrong about this myth? And by the way, I would like, in this case, I would like to point to 
a paper that you wrote together with Manvir Singh and I have an interview on the show with him about this paper that has, that's about going beyond the nomadic egalitarian model of hunter-gatherers because, I mean, at least if you're right about this, it seems that uh, that idea, that very common idea that we have that in prehistoric times in traditional societies, we were living in very egalitarian, uh, nomadic societies. That, uh, there, weren't re there weren't really very uh, strict hierarchies and stuff like that. Uh, if you're right, at least, it doesn't seem to be the case, right? Yeah, so there's there's really two different things going on in this question. One of them is that, you know, many of the shallow readers will say like, oh, we couldn't have war at that time because our societies were too egalitarian. They didn't have money, so they didn't have material resources that people would be stealing. So those determinants of war, like, you know, that you're raiding for resources weren't there or the idea that you have to mobilize people for war weren't there. Um, and the other idea is that the model that we often use to think about human societies in the past 100,000 years ago where individuals were living in small bands, they're mobile, they're pretty much egalitarian within age and gender, um, so individuals can't coerce each other, they're highly mobile, they don't accrue resources, there's very few status differences. So that's the nomadic egalitarian model. So Manvir and I have a paper arguing that while that might make sense at some point in our evolutionary history, there's actually evidence in the past 50,000 years, we think reasonably like persuasive evidence that humans had a, you know, a range of social organizations. So we marshal, we show data, I think from 30 some societies where there were levels of inequality. So, mm -hmm. and presumably if you see inequality, you're gonna see status hierarchies, you're gonna see some individuals being able to coerce each other more that there was um, levels of sedentism, meaning people weren't moving around all the time. And think about it, you know, I've lived with nomadic pastoralists. Um, moving, you know, moving where you're living is a lot of work. You break down your grass shelter, you have to move somewhere, you have to rebuild everything, you have to learn the landscape. And you think on early in our evolution, you know, there would have been tons of habitat, especially, you know, like lush river valleys and coastal regions that where you know um, uh, they had abundant resources that were prolific, so you wouldn't have necessarily needed to move around. You could stay there, and like every year the river, every season the river floods, and you've got plenty of fish, or you can you know forage for you know marine um, marine life. You would have time to develop socio-political complexity, potentially coercive institutions um, right. that would have enabled war. So that maybe the nomadic egalitarian model isn't the best model to think about recent human evolution. Um, so that's our argument. And like, you know, I think we'll see, you know, we'll see what people think about it. But I, I think we show that there are plenty of hunter gatherers who do not conform to the nomadic egalitarian model that we shouldn't think about it as the only model for human evolution. But nonetheless, even if the nomadic egalitarian model is true, that, you know, our ancestors the past 50,000, 100,000 years ago were all, you know, living in small mobile bands that were egalitarian, does that mean they didn't have anything to fight over? And does that mean that um, they weren't able to wage war? Well, yeah. you know, the idea that they're too egalitarian to wage war, I think, I think this debate really comes from what do you find, define as war? If you define war as requiring leadership and social structures and militaries, yeah, they're too egalitarian. But if you think of it as just like, you know, um, intergroup coalition or killing, it just requires a few individuals to go out with a spear, with clubs, with rocks, find another individual and kill that person, then being an egalitarian doesn't have anything to do with your ability to wage war. Egalitarian societies can hunt elephants, they can hunt hippos, they can hunt giraffes. Surely they can kill another individual. Um, and not having anything to fight over. Yeah, it's entirely true. They probably, material resources was not very important in warfare for um, nomadic hunter-gatherers. But one thing that does come up time and again is people kidnapping individuals in war, particularly reproductively viable individuals, usually young females. And this would have been present. Um, there's no reason to think nomadic hunter-gatherers wouldn't have done that. 
But secondly, um, I think one of the like findings that my work has contributed is that a lot of the reason that people go to war is not necessarily for material goods, but for social status from their own in-group members, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that like, I'm gonna go to war and I'm gonna steal a bunch of this. It's that like young men within their own group are competing for status. They're finding things, ways to distinguish themselves and they'll do, I mean, pretty much anything to distinguish themselves. And war is one way that individuals can distinguish themselves. So in that sense, they may be fighting over status, but status within their own group. Um, so I see a lot of small scale warfare as the product of status competition where individuals within their group are trying to find ways to compete status. And maybe that way is to go kill a big animal, you know, go kill a lion. Um, or maybe it's to kill an individual in another society. And speaking of like more recent groups, many small scale like pastoralist groups. So these are not hunter gatherers, but pastoralist groups in Ethiopia, um, Kenya, South Sudan will get the same social benefits, the same accolades if they kill a big game elephant, like a, kill a hippo or kill a lion as killing a human. You know, they may go through like rituals to note their status. They may get honorific insignia like scars, um, mm -hmm. you know, showing like how important that this sort of like risk taking and distinguishing yourself can be for individuals um, that are competing for status. And does this status also translate into higher fitness for those individuals? I'm, I'm meaning here fitness from the perspective of evol evolutionary biology, of course. Yeah, so this is this is the million dollar question is, does this like this status seeking behavior turn into like reproductive currency that then will benefit you evolutionarily? And mm -hmm. so especially with war, and that is a source of very live debate. So uh, I think the first question is, does status generally in small scale societies provide fitness benefits and overwhelmingly it does for men. The number where there have been a lot of studies, especially in the 90s, looking at social status and reproductive outcomes in small scale societies. And overwhelmingly for men, after age, the most important predictor of the number of children you have is your social status. Are you a high status individual? And this makes sense. We have a status seeking psychology for a reason right you know because it pays we don't individuals don't seek low status because it doesn't pay we seek high mm -hmm. status because evolutionarily it would have paid so if you just look at data on i think probably every small scale society in which it's been collected you find that high status individuals typically have more children now you can get status and the, these papers um i don't have my fingertip but I, I reviewed them as like part of my dissertation um there's lots of different ways to get status. Let's say you could be a shaman, you could be a leader, you could do traditional medicine. I'm just making stuff up. You could be really good at dancing. You could be a great hunter. But often one of the ways you get status in small scale societies is through warfare. Um, so if that generalization holds, you would expect that people that participated in war would do better reproductively than other people. And But there's not many studies looking at this at all. There's there's one by Shagnon, and I know on your show you've um, interviewed several people about it. And unfortunately, it's old and like we can't really replicate it today. So mm -hmm. it's very debatable on what the findings were. He found a very strong effect, um, but it's really a source of debate. Another study is one I did. It was my first like big paper as part of my PhD in 2015. I looked at um, nomadic pastoralists who were involved in cattle raiding. So they were stealing mm -hmm. cows from other families or other groups. They were often killing people. So it's a lot of the raiding is not just about cows. It's actually about trying to find someone to kill um, yourself. And I found that overwhelmingly older men who had been prolific raiders in their youth typically had more wives and more children. The effect for more wives was very, very strong. The effect for more children was not as strong. And I think it's because you're doing behaviors, you know, when you're 20 years old and it takes, you know, it takes time to recoup the benefits. So it might take 10 years before you get an extra wife. These are people who are married polygynously. So you can have five wives, 10 wives. 
So um, the effect for children wasn't as strong, but it's not, you know, a miracle of biological determinism. There's no, no biological determinism about it. I think what's ignored in the debate is there's always a mediating cultural pathway. It's not just like going to war, you have more children. There has to be a mediating cultural pathway. And for the groups I work with um, who are pastoralists, so I think they're primarily rating a lot for status to capture and cow, but then they're using those livestock to, you have to make bride wealth payment in the forms of cows. So if you want to get married, you have to give cows to the family of your wife. So they then have these extra cows that they've stolen. And some years later, they'll use those cows to get an extra wife as part of their bride wealth payment. So essentially they're richer, which enables them to marry an extra wife, which has more and have more children. So it's, you know, there's no biological determinism. There's no magic. It's just that, like, you use war as an arena to compete for status, which, you, you know, and other resources. Um, and obviously, you know, hunter-gatherers didn't have livestock that were stealing from each other or anything like that. So you don't expect it to be as tight of a correlation. But you do think, at least I do think, that if humans are motivated to status, it's probably going to pay in some way. Now, to head off what's probably going to be an objection, many people say, well, you know, your analyses and Shagnon's analyses are not excluding the people who were killed as part of a raid. Um, you know, so you're not taking into account your increased likelihood of dying. And unfortunately, like, you can't do anything with, like, you know, Shagnon's data so long, but you can look at this in other populations. And what you find is that the way the small scale warfare works is that there's very low risk to attackers. Attackers almost never are killed and injured in these small raids. It's because you have a group of maybe 10 guys who decide to go kill an individual or raid an individual from another tribe that they use, you know, they use surprise, they use stealth, they set an ambush, and they do so only when the opportunity, you know, when the chances of them being killed are very, very low. So and it's a similar pattern for chimpanzees. Um, you know, there's no documented cases of a chimpanzee attacker in a patrol where they're outnumbering the victim ever being seriously killed or injured. And there, there are more in humans because humans are, you know, are victims are armed with weapons, but it's still a very low risk because they're strategic in their use of uh, stealth and surprise. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we have the reverse kind of myth. That is that nomadic hunter-gatherers didn't make a peace. Uh, but yeah. that, that's also a myth. Right? Yeah, that's, you know, I, you know, I've been in this literature for, you know, a while now. And I see, like, both sides have these ideas um, that have some mythology about them. And the idea, you know, on one side is hunter-gatherers were like incessantly at war and you could never interact peacefully with your nature. And I think that's a myth. I think myth is the right word because, you know, hunter-gatherers are like people everywhere. Life in a state of war is not very nice for the mass majority of people. And, and the fact is, and, and Doug Fry is the one who really attuned me to this, um, his research is that like, if you actually look at just like everyday interactions and in hunter gatherers, like war is not present every day. Yes, many hunter gatherer societies, perhaps almost all of them experience war, but it might be once a year, it might be once every several years. Um, the vast majority of interactions are peaceful, they're cooperative. But further than that, when there is war, societies will often go to great lengths to try to restore peace, to try to restore cooperation. So they develop, you know, cultural technologies like rituals to make peace. You know, so, um, you know, like bearing types of weapons, like offering food to the other group, like doing um, symbolic dances or even having like mock competitions where they will shoot uh, arrows with no arrowheads at each other you know so you'll have groups of guys go out and they shoot blunt arrows with each other to like let it off and then dance and share food afterwards so you know hunter gatherers while you know i would say like vast majority of them experience war it doesn't mean that that characterizes every day and like people everywhere you know they're actively trying to find ways to make peace and they do make peace and you can look at you know it's i'm working on a project now um Actually trying to characterize the peace rituals for hunter-gatherers because it turns out there's a lot of cultural evolution on how to make peace and what do peace rituals have in common. Um, 
with each other and you know we haven't done our analysis yet but like it's it's not uncommon for hunter gatherers to have peace rituals and those peace rituals exist because it's important for people hunter gatherers to find ways to make peace with each other um you know so this is a in my opinion like a real contribution that's come out of the shallow the shallow roots perspective is that you know even if hunter gatherers do have warfare it doesn't mean it's an incessant state of war and even like you know the early a Carol Ember study, um, I think she called it like myths about hunter gatherers showed like they have war, but it's often like, you know, occasionally, like once every year or two. And by war, it may be like one or two raids. It's not like when we think of like World War One, where they're fighting every day. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess that here we also have to keep in mind that many times when we think about war and particularly because we live in uh, advanced, rich, uh, industrial or post-industrial Western societies, we tend to think of, about war on a very big scale and that goes on sometimes for years and years on end, but that's not at all what is most common among uh, traditional societies. Yeah, that's exactly right. We think about, you know, when the U.S. invaded Iraq and was over there, you know, there was some lethal conflict every day. You know, we say chimpanzees have war, but they may go months without a patrol. And then they have a patrol one day, and then it may be several weeks or months without a patrol. And the same for humans. I, I did a lot of my field work with nomadic pastoralists that had high rates of raiding or of war, but it may be a long period excuse me, a period of time before there was a raid. For the vast, you know, I mean, the vast majority of days are relatively peaceful, you know, in the sense that nobody's making war, there's no intergroup violence, and humans are actively seeking out ways to cooperate with other groups. You know, even their groups that, you know, maybe you've had a history of war with this other band or other tribe, but day to day, you're probably gonna try to find ways to interact with them peacefully if you can. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, uh, just since we're talking about uh, peace here, when it comes to the factors that Douglas Fry proposes as being the ones that contribute to peace between uh, human societies, you mentioned some of their some of them there like rituals. He also mentions, for example, he intermarriage, marrying someone from another tribe, another group, for example. Uh, do you agree with these analyses there? I mean, do you agree with, do you think that there's good enough evidence to support some of the factors that he suggests? Yeah, I think a lot of them are very plausible. I don't know how well they've been tested. You can imagine intermarriage coming because there actually already is peace. For instance, you know, there may be intermarriage, like somebody marries from another group and then they have nothing to do with each other in the same hand. So you don't imagine as being a necessary relationship. Um, the factor that he's pointed to that I, in my opinion, that's most important, but obviously most of these haven't been tested, is whether there are cultural norms that valorize or reward um, bellicose or warlike behavior. So do you, you know, so he talks about like peace systems and, and values for peace. So how do you get this? And, you know, I did a study early on in my PhD with Richard Rangham, where we looked at how much a society provides social or cultural benefits for warriors. Like, are you going to marry early? Are you going to get a special name? Or do people bring you special food? And we found like the more cultural benefits there are, the more that a society lionizes or valorizes war behavior, the higher the rates of war. And it's plausible that this is what really, it really motivates people. If you're gonna benefit, you know, if your society is gonna call you a hero, if you go act in war, you're probably gonna be tempted to do it. So I think, um, I think Doug Fry is, I would say we probably came at this, at least the importance of cultural systems separately, really right that the cultural values that a society has is really, really important. And at least I would think the primary way that you can change a behavior is to change the norms around that behavior. Um, and in, you know, in my in my own field work, you know, I, I work with nomadic pastoralists who have war, and there's a lot of in, you know, and there's a lot of cultural benefits to where you know you get scars if you're six honorific scars, you get a special name, you're treated with deference. Um, you know, and NGOs are there trying to change people's behavior. 
So they're trying to change the norms around it. You know, they're trying to talk to people and be like, you know, war produces a lot of pain and suffering. So maybe don't give these people their honorific name. Maybe don't give them blessings to try to change their behavior. Um, so I think he's really right that the cultural systems are probably the most important factor for um, reducing or preventing war and conversely for amping war up or making it more important. Yeah. So we've gone through some of the main points that both the shallow routers and the deep routers bring to the table and dis discuss among themselves. What do you think are the main points of disagreement between the two camps? Yeah, that, unfortunately, I think they disagree about every key premise. <laughs> um, you know, even like, you know, it's very well established chimpanzees, what Eastern chimpanzees have lots of war, it appears adaptive, that they benefit reproductively and naturally, yet some people still like deny the evidence or try to explain it away. They also disagree about whether hunter gatherer recent hunter gatherers had war, how important it was. Um, I mean, I feel like they disagree almost every point. And I really hope that my work, you know, because I have, I feel like I have a sort of a foot in both camps gets people to like consider more, um, more seriously the positions of the other side, you know, and I came at like writing this paper that you're sort of talking about that's in review now being sort of dissatisfied or unhappy with like the state of the literature where it's all like deep roots and shallow roots. And I wanted to like, I put together a list of like all the core premises and I wanted to like, find the best evidence for both sides, you know, and like the best argument and the weakest arguments. And I, you know, I hope I've done that. I don't know that I've gotten everything right, but, um, you know, that, um, I wanted to write the paper that I want to, I want to teach to my students that like, there's, um, there's a lot of myths, but there's a lot of, um, there are like good points on both sides of the debate. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to sum things up a little bit here, I would like to ask you two different kinds of questions about the deep routers and the shallow routers. So first of all, what do you think is the best evidence in support of the deep router and the shallow router position? Yeah, okay, I'll start with the shallow router position first. Okay. Um, you know, so I, I got, I came to this through the deep rooter. I used to be, I think like, you know, really in the deep rooter camp. Um, I wrote a paper that's often like cited by the shallow rooters. It's like bad thinking about hunter gatherer war. And, um, the shallow rooters have really convinced me that hunter gatherers do make peace, that war is not that common. And by war, I mean, actual acts of violence are generally not that common that most of society probably doesn't want it, that societies actively, or individuals within society, hunter-gatherer societies are often actively seeking out to make peace. So they really convinced me that the idea that hunter-gatherers are incessantly at war is not accurate. Um, instead, we should think about war as being like discrete temporally. There may be a raid, but you know, one day in the next 200 days, there's no acts of violence or 100, you know, you just pick a, pick a number but the vast majority of um, interactions are not warlike and societies often, or individual societies often trying to find ways to avoid war. Um, I think that's the best argument that they have, the strongest evidence. And, you know, it's really coming to accept that has really like changed my thinking on the, on the whole debate. So it's, okay. you know, I, I'm really, as much as I will disagree with the shallow rooters often, I'm really appreciative of them like driving that point home because it's, um, you know, they've convinced me of it. It's um, true. What I think the strongest evidence for deep rooters are that um, if you look at hunter gatherers surrounded by hunter gatherers, so not hunter gatherers that have been conquered by a stronger nation, you know, not hunter gatherers living in state society, not hunter gatherers that are surrounded by, um, you know, colonists or agriculture, but hunter gatherers surrounded by hunter gatherers. Overwhelmingly, you will find almost every society experiences war at least once in a while. Um, the papers that say they don't, I think some of them are just like intellectually duplicitous or misleading. Um, if you go and read the ethnography and so you take out, you know, hunter gatherers living in a state society, you find like 
war is present. And this makes sense. Hunter gatherers are people like us. If you look at, you know, nations in the 20th century, most of them experienced war sometime. It doesn't mean life is always at war. It'd be very strange to think about human societies that are somehow like in a state of like harmony and never experience war. So um, I think that's the strongest evidence that hunter gatherers all over the world experience war at least once in a while. And since we're talking about the debate between the two sides here, what do you think uh, tends to be the evidence from the opposite side that the deep rooters and the shallow rooters tend to dismiss the most or perhaps misinterpret? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's very, I think the answer to that is very s similar. I think the deep rooters really sort of ignore, they, they, and maybe it's just like the ambiguity of what we mean by there's war. I think when they say war, they maybe think that like it's incessant war, that there's war all the time, um, you know, that there's no peaceful interactions. And I think that that's wrong. I think um, as Doug Fry has pointed out and, and others, there's lots of peaceful interactions. Probably the bulk of interactions, even if they're not peaceful or not warlike, you know, they may be tolerant or they may just avoid each other. Um, and I, so I think most of them haven't taken that as seriously as they probably should. And that may be because for two reasons. One, the sort of like chimpanzee model, especially the Eastern chimpanzee model, where groups just do not have, community, different communities just do not have harmonious relationships. Mm -hmm. If you think that that's the ancestral model of human evolution, you may not look as carefully at human relationships to realize, oh, there's plenty of like peaceful interactions. Um, on the other hand, I think the shallow readers really have not taken as seriously as they should the evidence that hunter-gatherers often have war. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's incessant war. It just means that, like, yeah, once in a while, some members of that group will go and kill a member of another group. And so do you think that then perhaps one of the biggest points of disagreement here has to do with the frequency of war? Um, well, I think that they they haven't articulated it like that. I think, um, I think that that's sort of implicit. The frequency is implicit in what you mean by war. So the deep rooters say, oh, they have war. They may be thinking like war is incessant. You know, they haven't defined it. So their intuition may be like it's incessant, yeah. or the shallow rooters may be thinking the deep rooters think it's incessant. So this is would it be more useful to like specify what do we mean by they have war? Yeah. And for what I mean is just like once in a while members of that society will kill members of another society. Um, but shallow readers may think that we mean actually all the time. But actually, I think the I think the real disagreement, the sources of the real disagreement are deeper. I actually think they're at an epistemic and value level. Um, so what I mean by that is that most of the shallow readers that I'm familiar with, like define themselves as like uh, peace scholars, right? So, um, you know, they define themselves as uh, they define themselves as being scholars of peace or peace studies. So David Baresh, I think you've had on your show, he says like there's a value orientation in favor of peace and against war, and that sounds that sounds all fine, right? Like we almost all of us, like everyone I know at least, is in favor of peace and against war. But implicit in that is the idea that if you say somehow we evolved to have war, our war is natural in some sense, you're going to either be saying it's permissible for people to go to war, or you're going to be saying that war is inevitable, we can't get rid of it. Um, so I think there's a real worry about doing that, which causes causes some scholars, um, peace scholars, to try to do anything they can to say, like, war is not natural, war is a in recent invention. Um, I think that this is the real locus of disagreement, um, even though, you know, like prominent deep rooters like Richard Rangham is a pacifist. He's like utterly opposed to war. I think the the idea whether you think individuals, so if, if we say war is somehow natural is going to encourage people to go to war or not, comes down to how you weight the evidence. Um, this is really unfortunate. I actually got interested in the study of war by the, I read Samantha Power's book on genocide, you know, A Problem from Hell. At the same time I read Richard Rangham's book, Demonic Males. And I was like, this is so important. You know, our society is plagued by war. If we can study it scientifically, we can try to figure out 
how to reduce it. And I went to graduate school. I got my PhD studying war with this idea that if we're like scientifically honest about the causes of war, maybe, and we write it up, maybe policymakers can design policies to make it um, war disappear. You know, it's not maybe not entirely go away ever, unfortunately, but you know, approach zero. Um, and I don't think we're ever going to do that unless we're really honest about the causes of war. And I think you know, I guess I would say that both to the deep rooters and the shallow rooters, like we do really need to like be honest about the scientific evidence and the scientific evidence shows hunter gatherers often make peace. Um, they seek out ways to do peace. The vast majority of interactions are peaceful, but the evidence also shows that they, that most hunter gatherer societies occasionally experience war. Mm -hmm. um, and if we can agree on that, then we can move on to figure out what are the social and ecological determinants of war. Right. And I mean, uh, in fact, you, I think you've already answered another question that I had here because I was uh, really about to ask you. Um, so do you think that uh, the solution to this debate, I mean, if war is really deep rooted in our revolution or not, would have uh, implications for modern societies. And what I mean by that is uh, so uh, implications in terms of we, of war being part of human nature, let's put it that way. And so we can't really uh, never uh, fully get rid of it. And also uh, implications in the sense that uh, the way uh, we think about how war has evolved and if it's part of our human nature or not would have implications in terms of how we look at war in modern societies and how we wage war because i, I mean perhaps some people might think that uh, we would find war more justifiable if it was part of our nature if it's part of our psychology yeah so would people find war more justifiable as part of our psychology i guess that's an empirical question i don't know the answer to but i would hope not right mm -hmm. lots of things may be part of our psychology but that doesn't make them good xenophobia mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. probably part of our psychology it doesn't make it good Lots of, you know, types of potential crime and violence may be, you know, homicide, right? You know, getting angry, using anger and violence to get what you want, probably, you know, part of our evolved psychology, but doesn't make it justified. So I would hope that people would recognize, even if there is some evolutionary biological basis, doesn't make it justified. And the really amazing, like the extraordinary thing about our species is we're both biological, but we are cultural. We can shape our world through cultural norms and cultural values. Even if war was super important in human evolution, and I'm not saying it was, but even if it was, we know we can drive it to almost zero through the right cultural institutions. You know, um, there's, there's the very famous list of peaceful societies. Mm -hmm. And some of those societies are enclave, they're living in fear of others, but some of those societies are like seemingly like genuinely peaceful, like they've adopted mm -hmm values of peacefulness that promote tolerance, that promote forgiveness, that promote cooperation. And I have every confidence that at least on a, you know, on a smaller level, it's possible to get groups of people to adopt or smaller societies to adopt specific values, values of tolerance and cooperation, um, even if war is really important in our psychology. Um, so I, I don't find the like, I don't find the arguments about like, oh, we have to be scared to talk about it because people use it as justification for war. People have been having war, I mean, as long as we have written history, they don't need to point to evolutionary science for a justification for war, right? You know, like that's not gonna be like, oh great, we should go invade whatever country because some, some scientist at Boston University or Harvard said we evolved to have war. People are gonna have war if they find, you know, what, whatever is motivating them to have war. What's important is that we figure out how to persuade people not to have war, that, you know, we figure out how to promote values of tolerance and cooperation. Um, the other part of your question was, yeah, is 
what it, maybe it's like something like the implications of war for human evolution. I can't remember the first part of your question. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, if the, if war being deeply rooted in our in our evolution would imply, I, I guess that you've already ended up uh, answering it to some extent. But if it would imply that we can't really get uh, fully rid of it ever. <laughs> Yeah, so like, let's just say, let's bracket this question about war and look at other aspects of human psychology. We know that humans have a coalitionary psychology. We divide the world into in-groups and out-groups, and we're willing to do things to benefit our in-group and harm our out-group. This is like a fundamental feature of human psychology. Another fundamental feature of human psychology is that we use aggression strategically. Right? It doesn't mean violence. You could use violence, but we do things. We use aggression strategically. Just those two features of human psychology would produce societies that make war. You're going to have people form coalitions and people within that coalition, those coalitions want to use aggression sometimes and mobilize the rest of their coalition to use aggression strategically, mm -hmm. i.e. violence. So even ignoring whether war was important in human evolution, just those features of human psychology would get you war. So it's one of the things that I think we'll always, like our species will always have to watch out for. We can't re rewrite or rewire human psychology, but what we can do is engineer social institutions mm -hmm. to counteract those facets. You know, that's why it's so important to understand the cultural systems that promote war, because then you can engineer cultural systems to eliminate or prevent war. Mm -hmm. So let's get now a little bit more into some of the work you've been doing on human cooperation. So how do small scale societies achieve large scale cooperation? Yeah, it's um it's a great question because it's debatable, many people debate whether small scale societies do achieve large scale cooperation. Um so just what do you mean by small scale societies? You're usually referring to subsistence societies where the people within them produce most of the goods and foods they consumed. They're not integrated or poorly integrated into state societies, interactions face to face. There's customary institutions and kinship structures that are the dominant forms of social organizations. And there's no formal leaders or coercive power. So, you know, small tribes and man, a few hundred to a few thousand. And the dominant narrative is that these societies don't produce any type of large scale cooperation. They're just, you know, living in small bands, nomadic hunter gatherers, having a very little footprint. But it's it's gradually changing um, through work that, you know, uh, Boyd and Richardson have done, through work that Doug Bird has done, through work that Manvir Singh and I have done that, you know, we find that societies and not all small scale societies but many many small scale societies find ways to align the interests of their group members to coordinate their behavior to do things like um, large scale hunting or develop ritual traditions that can involve potentially hundreds of people um, cultural technologies that may be verbal and shared or individuals within small scale societies are embedded in larger social networks or webs of relationships that can span hundreds and hundreds of miles. Um, so how do we do this? How do small scale societies do this outside of like formal institutions um, or formal course of power? One of the ways they do it is by developing norms that recognize overlapping or aligned interests. So what is in the interests of people in that group to do? And then they find ways to enforce those to enforce cooperation and often this is through you know reputation or indirect reciprocity so mm -hmm. it's uh, so in that way it's similar to like how sort of modern societies do it but i think one of the like sort of more novel aspects is recognizing that small scale societies even though they may be small in population are actually achieving types of cooperation that are like similar to what we think of industrial societies, but we're not doing it from the top down, or they're not doing it from the top down. They're doing it from the bottom up, and it's still a, it's still a bit of a live question as what the most important mechanisms are. Mm -hmm. And this is really fascinating, right? Because when we think about 
comparing uh, traditional societies to the more modern industrialized or post-industrial societies, or, or also previously to the societies based on agriculture, we tend to think about human society as progressively expanding in terms of population size and also the ways people are able to expand, for example, their notion of group identity to include more people and for societies to get large. But in fact, perhaps some of those aspects were already to some extent present uh, prehistorically. Yeah, I, I really, I really like that question because you know we've been talking, we've been talking about war and whether it's important human evolution, but you could, you could, you could switch the whole argument and replace war with, say, pro-social psychology, yeah. or psychology to interact with uh, other individuals. And what we see if we look all over the world is yes, humans do divide us in, in groups and out groups, but we readily accept new members of groups. Right? We easily adopt individuals if, as members of our group. Someone moves to my neighborhood, they come to my university. We have no problem accepting them as members of our group. So our social boundaries, while we have them, are very, very flexible. Yeah. Um, you know, they're extremely porous. And this is the case all over the world, right? Like it's not unique to like modern human societies. And to me, I think about just as like war may have been important in human evolution, inter flexible intergroup boundaries or intergroup cooperation was probably also important. So, you know, bonobos have high levels of tolerance with other bonobos. They can, and chimpanzees can't really be around other groups. Bonobos can be around, they can tolerate each other and sometimes cooperate with each other. So like an alternative model of human evolution is where early human groups were tolerant of each other. They sometimes cooperate it. But as we begin to depend more on cultural technology, so we depend, begin to depend more on like specialized tools or specialized weapons or specialized knowledge, such as like where to get this type of plan or where to get this type of food or even like religious beliefs, you know, um, we would have had more reasons to interact with members of other groups, creating more benefits to interaction and then selecting for a psychology that is more tolerant and cooperative with others. And I think I don't understand how modern humans could have a psychology that is so readily able to interact with strangers without this having been important in our species history. You know, like it, it how in the world would we have this psychology where we can just easily adopt member, you know, adopt strangers into our social group without in our history, us having been interacting with members of other social groups and relying on them and cooperating with them. But these things are not, this is this argument is not exclusion with war. Both of these can be operating at the same time and selecting for different things. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, human cooperation sometimes also fosters aggression and conflict. It's also the fact that we cooperate so well within our own groups that we are able to also wage war and conflict against other groups. So what are the main costs and benefits of intergroup cooperation and aggression? Yeah, the main costs and benefits to intergroup cooperation. Um, so I think it's important to get clear on like what the level is and who you're talking about. So you can imagine a group, you know, a group consists of n number of individuals, 10 individuals. So there's the costs to the individuals who are waging war and the benefits to them. And then there's the cost to the other individuals that are not waging war that are maybe, you know, five of the 10 individuals go on a raiding party. You assess their costs and benefits, but you also assess the other five. So I think, you know, we often think about war as like, oh, you know, the group benefits, or at least this is a lot of the literature, but I think the reality is that in war, the individuals who, in small-scale decentralized war, the individuals who perpetrate war will benefit frequently through social status, or they may benefit through like if they take captives or some other spoils. They may benefit through material goods, they may benefit through social status, but unless it's cases of overwhelming conquest, which I don't think of that often among hunter or occur that often among hunter-gatherers, the rest of the group 
experiences costs. So there's collective costs. So the net welfare of the non-participants may go down because war often results in like unused border zones. So like if, you know, we're part of a group, we're living in a band and, you know, five of our guys go out and kill another person from another group. Well, we know that other group is probably going to want revenge. So we're going to be scared to go over to that water hole. We're going to be scared to go to, you know, those hunting grounds because we know that we might be victims of retaliatory violence. So there can be net costs to the rest of the group in terms of like reduction in food, reduction in territory, reduction in water. I see this with the pastoralist groups I work with all the time, something like massive amounts of grasslands are unused because they're just dangerous to go into. But um, you also lose cooperative opportunities, right? Not only are you like nervous about going over to the other, or nervous about going over there, you don't necessarily wanna trade with them because you worry someone on that side might take revenge. Um, and then revenge typically doesn't fall against the perpetrator. It doesn't fall against the individual who goes on the raiding party because the other group doesn't know which person it was. It falls against just like anybody in that group, any social group. So thus I think of like war as imposing a collective costs on the group while the individuals who wage it may benefit. And this is why it's really difficult to control is because in small scale decentralized societies because it only takes like, you know, just a couple of yahoos to start a war and then the rest of the society, society has to deal with the consequences of it. Uh, and so related to that, to conflict and peace, there's a question I'd like to ask you that I didn't ask when we were talking about the debate between the deep rooters and the shallow rooters, but I think is also important to tackle here. So is peace easy to maintain <laughs> yeah um yeah so i think of peace as the solution to a collective action problem so it requires okay. everybody cooperating right nobody deciding like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna individually benefit myself by going on a raid over there and stealing some of their cows right even though i might be better off than the rest of the group so everybody has to decide you know, we're gonna cooperate or at least be nice to members of the other group, at least avoid them and tolerate them. Um, so it's the solution to collective action problem and collective action problems are notoriously very tricky to solve. And I think the only way you solve them in human society is this type of collective action problem is social structures. So these are cultural traditions, cultural institutions that align the incentives of each group member towards peace, towards cooperation and not using violence. So one of the ways you do this is by, um, by um, having cultural norms that do not encourage violence. But another way you do it is by sanctions. Like if somebody's gonna go, someone are gonna go, in our group is gonna go raid the other group, they'll be subject to sanctions. They'll be subject to gossip. They'll be subject to ridicule. They might be subject to physical beatings. This happens sometimes individuals who are going to go on raids against another group will actually be subject to you know the elders or their age mates will pull them aside and actually physically beat them to stop them from going on a raid so i think the only way you're going to solve the problem of peace and by that i mean create the conditions in which there's stable peace is through cultural institutions um and but then it's always going to be a challenge because you're always going to have to watch out for the defector the like you know small group of individuals who want to go, you know, spoil the peace. And in the, you know, the peace literature, um, like, you know, NGOs, do, they call they call people who break the peace spoilers. You know, so if you're working with NGOs that are trying today in the 21st century to create peace between tribes, like where I work in East Africa, they'll call the young men who go and break the peace spoilers. You know, these spoilers broke the peace. So uh, I have one last question then. Yeah. This is something we haven't talked about yet. Uh, regarding the emergence of a coalitional conflict, what role do key individuals play? Because of course this, is, this doesn't need to be necessarily related to that, but of course when we think about human conflict, war, uh, there's also that uh, common idea that we have that Perhaps there are there are some very influential individuals that really uh, push for it and that really cause the war. So, uh, what role do individuals really play here? Yeah. So this is um, 
you know, so I feel like we have a reasonably good understanding of the evolution of war, of the like factors in our species history, which might have given rise to a psychology of war. And we understand sort of the psychological processes, I think, at an individual level of war. But we don't understand really well why is there war right now and not at a different time? Why mm -hmm. is there war here in this village and not in that village, right? At this meso level between the sort of like ultimate and proximate, between the like, um, evolutionary and the psychological we really don't understand much about the variation of war um, across space and time so this is an argument that specific individuals can be instrumental in promoting war or peace right it doesn't have to be war but really any type of high cost activity um either because they're going to benefit exceptionally well or maybe it's just easy for them right like you can imagine um nobody in society really wants to go to war and then they like you know a guy joins their group who's like really gung-ho he's like i know the enemy territory i'm really good you know i can shoot arrows 100 meters uh, you know and i can reload them like crazy um you know and he's like you know three meters tall you can imagine that the presence of that individual altering the costs and benefits of the rest of the group making war more likely so this is an argument that individuals that have specific characteristics or they pay differential costs and benefits alter the costs and benefits for the rest of the group making either violence more likely or making peace or any other high cost behavior more likely and there's evidence from chimpanzees that chimpanzee hunting of monkeys is often initiated by specific individuals who are just more prone to hunt monkeys and once they go the rest of the group goes um, the same with chimpanzee patrols, it looks like there's individuals who are just more motivated to patrol. I think the same thing probably happens with a lot of small scale warfare. In my data, we saw that some individuals just were much more likely to lead a raiding party. Um, you know, and it takes somebody to be asking their friends, hey, let's go on a raid, let's go on a raid. Um, another way to think about it, I, you know, is thinking earlier, I was thinking about like the January 6th, um, I don't know what, it, what you're supposed to call it now, insurrection, riots or whatever, but would the Capitol have been stormed if Donald Trump hadn't shown up that day, right? If Donald Trump hadn't provoked the crowd, so you can think about like all the conditions are there, all the conditions are right, but it takes this one person at time to sort of like add that extra spark to alter the either costs and benefits or the perceived costs and benefits. Um, so in that sense, you can think of him as a key individual, just like, you know, for that particular action. And the idea is that they're not key individuals everywhere. They're just individuals who sort of spark a collective action, either in war or peace or any other behavior um, at this specific moment in time. That's very interesting because uh, doesn't that put things into perspective when it comes to, for example, when in history we see those debates between people uh, about specific events in history, let's say a war, since we're talking about that here, what really caused it, if it was really the, um, let's say, the economic political, social conditions that it would have inevitably, inevitably led to it. It doesn't matter who the leader was, the, the war was basically set in stone if those conditions were in place, or if, if it really was a specific person causing it, and of course the conditions also helped fueling it, but it was the person causing it, because uh, it might be both. Right. Yeah, you, um, that's an interesting way to think about it. I'm not sure how much you can scale this up to like macro sociology. Um, yeah. You know, certainly, you know, there's things where you can imagine like the conditions for war are mm -hmm. right. You know, like it looks like war could break out and it just requires some individual to like step into that void and either, you know, initiate war or, you know, add water to the coals, you know, and, and uh, make peace. But um, I don't know, like, I don't know how far you can push it, whether you can like push it all the way to like, you know, I'm just thinking like the great man theory, where it's like individuals, you know, that are shaping all of history, you know, I think yeah. sociological import forces are really important. If a key individual 
shows up, let's say, in a culture of peace, a culture that has really strong values of peace and tolerance, you know, someone who's really bellicose for war, they're probably not going to get very far. They're not going to be able to get individuals to go to war. Um, Donald Trump probably would not have had the power he would have he had at a different point in our history. You know, the sociological conditions were yeah. right. Um, yeah, no, but uh, I mean, in this case, I was just suggesting yeah. that maybe uh, it could, uh, when, for example, there's a large scale event, like, for example, a war, uh, we would need maybe both factors, perhaps. Uh, we already have yeah. the, the conditions there for war to be waged, but there's someone that has to sort of yeah. pull the trigger for it to happen. Yeah, you need, yeah, you actually need, you need someone to like initiate it, you know, yeah. all the, you know, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Glowacki, perhaps this is a good point to end on. Just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Yeah, so, um, you know, like, like everybody, uh, Google Scholar is a great place to see my publications. Um, the two papers we've been talking about, there's both evolution of peace and myths about the origins of war. There's both preprints, so like, I would love it if like you were inspired to go take a look, read them, send me your critical feedback. Um, you know, that's how that's how science advances. So they're both available online. Um, I have a website, you can find me by Google, but I also run um, with Zachary Garfield, a nonprofit called the Omo Valley Research Project. We have a website. Um, if you just go type that in Google, you'll find it. And we provide scholarships to Ethiopia students. So, um, you know, students mostly from the areas where we do field work to go to university or med school or vet school. So um, if you're interested in that type of thing, you know, check us out, Omo Valley Research Project at our website there. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. And I, I love your podcast. I, I find it inspiring um, to hear what uh, what so many scholars are up to and what they're thinking about. Well, thank you so much for the kind words. And of course, it was a big pleasure to everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like, a comment. And if you can, please support me on Patreon or PayPal. You can find the links in, down in the description box. Just $1 per month would already be a great help. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. And I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Perga Larson, Jerry Mueller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernard Seixas, Olaf Alex, Adam Kessel, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Enrique Lenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassi, Zup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Kavanagh, Mikkel Stormir, Samuel Andrea, Francis Ford, Thiago Nunes, Fergal Cusson, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Jonathan Leibrand, John Linear, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Leira, Tom Hummel, Sardis France, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londoño Correa, Yannick Puntar, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbar, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Beck, Guy Madison, Gary G. Alman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litsky, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, jo John Wiseman, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, Georgius Theophanes, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Moray, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheists, Larry Dilly Jr., Old Erringbun, Starry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassi, Igor N., Jeff McMahon, Jake Zuel, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Kimberly Johnson, Benjamin Galbert, Jessica Nowicki, Linda Brandin, Nicholas Carlson, Ismael Ben Zuliman, George Coriatis, Valentin Steinman, Per Crowleys, Kate Von Goller, Alexander Hubbard, Liam Dunaway, BR, and Masood Ali Mohammadi. A special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Franks, Lucas Tafiniak, Tom Vanegdam, 
Bernard Hugh, Nick Ortiz Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Al Nick Ortiz and Nick Golden, and to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codrian, Bogdan Canivets and Vege G. Thank you for all.